Well, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I've asked the clerk to place the MOM COS in brief uh, on the seats of the members at the start of the sitting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I also seek your permission to display some slides on the LED screen? Thank yes, you. <coughs> Sir, employment landscape has changed in the past three years, from 2015 to 2017, compared to the previous three years, from 2012 to 2014. Net job growth slowed from more than 100,000 a year to less than 10,000 a year. Retrenchment went up to 19,000 in 2016, Resident unemployment rate increased to 3.2% in December 2016. Long-term unemployment rate went up to 0.8% to in September 2016. The reasons were partly cyclical, but mostly structural. Externally, faster pace of technology and innovation, and keener and stronger competition. Internally, aging of local population and changing profile of our local workforce. Manpower-driven growth of the past was no longer sustainable. Low productivity growth will weaken our economic competitiveness. Fast growth of foreign manpower will increase social tension and weaken our social cohesion. This is why we have to transform our economy to be more innovative, manpower-lean, and productive. As we transform, we are mindful that one main concern out there is about jobs. Will technology destroy more old jobs? Will foreigners take away more new jobs? Will we end up with jobless growth for our people? Ms. Jessica Tan, Mr. Li Shan, Mr. Desmond Chu, and Associate Professor Faisal Ibrahim asked whether our locals have benefited from the economic growth and transformation efforts. Again, comparing past three years, 2015 to 2017, with the previous three years, 2012 to 2014. Even though growth of foreign employment has turned negative, local employment growth has rebounded to 21,000 last year. Quality of local employment has improved too. PMBT share of local workforce went up faster in the past three years than the previous three years. In terms of wage growth, annualized real income growth of our residents for the previous three years is shown in grey. And, and for the past three years, it's shown in pink. So gray means 20, 2012 to, 2015, uh, 2012 to 2014. Uh, pink means 2015 to 2017. We can see that real income group grew faster across all income groups, up from the 2.3% to 3.7%. We can also see that wages at P20 and P30 not only grew faster than before, but also higher than most income groups. Sir, economic and workforce restructuring is never painless, but we have to do what is necessary. We are certainly in a better shape today. In the past three years, manpower growth has slowed from an average of 4% to 1%. While productivity gain has grown from 0.4% previously to 1.8%, over the last three years. On the average, 1.8% per year over the last three years. Having transformed from a high manpower growth, low productivity gain of 4 plus 0.4 equal to 4.4, 4% manpower growth, 0.4% productivity growth to give us 4.4% GDP growth. From 2012 to 2014, we have transformed to 1 plus 1.8 equal to 2.8 in the last three years. 1% manpower growth, 1.8% growth in productivity to give us the average of 2.8% growth in our GDP. We are not much closer to our future growth strategy of 1 plus 2 equal to 3. Sir, 1 plus 2 equal to 3 is not a rigid formula for future growth, but it is a framework to remind us of the need to become more manpower lean and more productive if we want to ensure that our future growth will be more sustainable. Mr. Desmond Chu asks if the productivity growth is sustainable. So we make good progress, but transformation is uneven, not pervasive enough across all sectors. To make transformation and productivity growth more sustainable, we must press on with four key trusts. And these are better job growth in our economy, better employment outcomes 
for our people, better protection for our workers, and lastly, better capabilities in our Singapore workforce. First, better job growth in our economy. Average net job growth of less than 10,000 a year in the past three years was not high enough. We need to bring it up to about 25,000 to 40,000 a year to provide enough jobs for a 3.4 million workforce growing at about 1%. We must also keep improving the quality and attractiveness of jobs to meet the higher aspiration of our people. So instead of developing lean enterprises individually, we need to develop lean industry collectively, especially for sectors that are less attractive to our locals today. Minister Josephine Teo will elaborate on this. Second, better employment outcomes for our people. Last year, under the Adapt and Growth Initiative, we helped more than 25,000 job seekers to secure jobs successfully. Even though resident unemployment rate has declined since June last year, we are still concerned that unemployment in future is likely to be stickier. Not due to shortage of jobs, but shortage of skills and job skill mismatch, I think a concern also shared by Mr. Lau. We have enhanced the National Jobs Bank into an online portal known as My Career Future. We, have also, or rather, we are also strengthening the Adapt and Grow initiative to minimize mismatches and mismatches. Minister Josephine Teo will elaborate later. So as we make our economy more innovative, we must also keep our workforce inclusive. Young and old, high and low, in terms of age and skill profile, and for both genders. For our older workers, re-employment age was raised from 65 to 67 last year. Employment rates for mature workers age 55 to 64 and 65 and above has continued to improve. We're also actively promoting more companies to make better use of technology to make jobs ESS easier, safer, smarter for our mature workers. Mr. Zaina Sapari and Dr. Intan suggested raising their CPF contribution rates. Mr. Heng Chi Hao suggested to review the need for statutory retirement and also to raise the rate employment age further beyond 67. So the Trapata Committee on Employability of Older Workers was set up in 2005. These issues raised by Mr. Heng, Mr. Zainal Sapari and Dr. Intam are important issues. The Trapata Committee will study them. <coughs> so for low-wage workers, I agree with members that we must do more to improve their skills, productivity, careers and wages in a more sustainable manner. We introduced the Progressive Wage Model, PWM, for cleaning in 2014, followed by landscaping and security two years later in 2016. The outcome is positive. A few days ago, I came across a straight time article by NUS economists Kenneth Le and Ivan Peng titled Impact of Progressive Wage Model. And I quote, in sum, as a kind of minimum wage policy, as a unique kind of minimum wage policy, the PWM has succeeded in raising wages without apparently reducing employment. More importantly, <coughs> as a tailored, structured and progressive policy, it provides a wage ladder for low-skilled Singaporean workers, holding out its promise of growing income over time. End of quote. Sir, will make the adoption of progressive wage model more widespread to benefit more workers. MOS Sam Tan will elaborate later. Third, better protection for our workers. Our workforce is changing fast. We now have more PMETs, fewer rank and file. This trend will continue. Our employment landscape is changing too. With growth of the platform economy, we can expect to see more freelancers and self-employed person. We are concerned for them in terms of skill upgrading, fair treatment, loss of income due to injury or illness, and savings for healthcare and retirement. Minister Josephine Teo will elaborate on this later. For the vast majority who still engage in jobs with employer and employee relationship, Mr. Patrick Tay and Dr. Ng Tan call for a review of the Employment Act. I agree with them. Currently, 
Employment Act covers three groups of employees. First, all workmen who are manual workers or blue-collar workers, including most technicians. Second, all non-workmen who are non-manual workers or white-collar workers. And lastly, some, but not all, managers and executives with a salary cap of 4,005. With PMETs making up 56% of local workforce now, going up to 65% by 2030, it's timely to make a more fundamental change to the coverage of EA. In consultation with Trapatai partners, we've decided to enhance our current EA framework. First, we'll remove the salary cap of EA to cover all employees, including all PMETs. I'm sure Mr. Patrick Tay must be very happy to hear this because he's been championing this for many years. The exceptions are public servants, domestic workers, and seafarers who are covered separately, such as by other acts due to their nature of work. Now, all core employee benefits in the EA, including annual leave, paid public holidays, paid sick leave, and paid hospitalization leave, and other protections, such as timely payment of salary, maternity protection, and childcare leave, statutory protection against wrongful dismissal, and the right to preserve terms and conditions, uh, existing terms and conditions for employment transfer, resulting for sales of businesses and business restructuring, all this will now be extended to all employees. And this will cover an additional 430,000 PMEs. Mr. Patrick Tay asked for more clarity on the type of transfers within or outside the scope of Section 18A about sales of businesses, business restructuring. We agree that more clarity is useful. We will work with tripartite partners to update our guidelines on this. Second, we will extend additional protection on hours of work and overtime payment to more workers. For workmen, current salary cap of 4,005 already cover more than 99% uh, of the workmen, so there will be no change. But for non-workmen, the current cap of 2,005 will be raised to 2006, so that this enhancement will extend coverage to half of our workforce. As for overtime pay, salary cap for non-workmen will be revised upwards from 2,250 to 2,600. About 100,000 non-workmen will benefit from this increase. The third and final change to the EA concerns dispute resolutions relating to salary dispute or wrongful dismissal. Currently, all salary-related disputes are mediated at TADEM. If unresolved, the claims are then heard at the ECT, Employment Claim Tribunal. But wrongful dismissal are adjudicated by MOM, not ECT. We'll shift it over to ECT to provide both employers and employees with one-stop service. We'll seek Parliament approval of this amendment to EA later this year for implementation by 1st April next year. Mr. Daniel Goh spoke about protection for contract workers. Tripartite Partners launched the Tripartite Standard on the Employment of Turn Contract Employees in July last year. For contracts of 14 days or more, uh, the guideline, the standard call for companies to treat contracts renewed within one month from the end of the previous contract as continuous and cumulative in terms of the length of service for the computation of leave benefits and the notice pay for early termination or non-renewal. It also calls for companies to provide training to ensure that their contract workers can perform, can perform their roles effectively. Professor Daniel Go asked for an update. Now, as of end of February, more than 550 employers covering more than 30,000 turn contract employees have adopted these standards. So far, we have not received any complaint from any of these contract employees. Associate Professor also suggested that we should conduct audits and surveys and to include retention benefits in this standard. Now, being a new standard, our focus now of the tripartite partners is to increase the adoption by more employers. So we'll look into the suggestions by Professor Daniel Goh uh, when we next review the standard. Another, sir, another important area of protection for our workers is a safety and health. Through joint efforts of tripartite partners, our WSH performance has improved. Fertility rate has dropped to 1.2 last year, lowest level ever record 
ever recorded for our workforce. Our next target under the WSH 2028 is uh, to be formulated, is to bring it down further to below one per 100,000 workers. We're also committed to reduce workplace injuries as well as to enhance workplace health by embracing a mindset of total workplace health and safety. Most at the same time will elaborate later. Last but not least, our fourth and probably one of the most critical challenges is to ensure that slower growth of our Singapore workforce will not become the bottleneck in the future growth of our Singapore economy. Today, Singapore workforce of 3.4 million is made up of 2.3 million local, two-thirds of the total workforce, and 1.1 million foreigners, one-third of our total workforce. So two-third local plus one-third foreign give us one Singapore workforce. With slower, with slower manpower growth into the future, we need to maximize the potential of our two-third local and our one-third foreign, so that together we can maximize the potential of our total Singapore workforce. We must strive for two-third plus one-third, not just equal to one, but greater than one. First, we must not allow two-third plus one-third to be less than one. And this could happen if unfair employers discriminate against our local uh, workers. Now, to prevent this from happening, we are pro-business, but only to those businesses who are pro-workers. We've identified 500 companies so far. They have the preconceived ideas that our local PMBTs are either unable or unwilling to do the job. So they write them off without even considering them fairly. We therefore put them on our FCF Fair Consultation Framework watch list. Their EP applications are subjected to additional scrutiny. This is to eradicate nationality bias, I think as described by Mr. Peter Tay. In response to Mr. Peter Tay, Patrick Tay, my, my apologies. In response to Mr. Patrick Tay and Mr. Chong Ki Hyong, these companies on our watch list, they come from various sectors, including employment agencies and placement companies. Mr. Patrick Day, Jessica Tan, Ms. Jessica Tan, Mr. Chong Ki Hyong, Mr. Lim Biao Chuan, and Professor Faisal Ibrahim asked on an update. Since we started in February 2016, a total of 1,900 EP applications have been withheld or rejected by the MOM or withdrawn by the companies. TAFEP, the Tripartite Alliance for Fair Employment Practices, worked with them to improve their HR practices. WSG, Workforce Singapore, NTC E2I, and the IHL work with them to recruit fresh graduates and our local mid-career PMETs. As a result, more than 2,200 Singaporean PMETs were hired by these companies. One of these companies is an IT services firm with more than 1,000 PMET employees. It was placed on watch list in February 2016. The company worked with TAFEP and IMDA to attract and retain locals and hire about 200 more Singaporeans. After exiting from the watch list, this company continues to adopt fairer and more progressive HR practices. And indeed, these are win-win outcomes for both the business and the workers. Another example, a private wealth management company with 80 PMBT employees. They used to hire mostly foreign PMBTs to serve mostly expatriate clients. It was placed on a watch list in February 2016. Since then, it has repositioned to serve both local and expatriate clients, and it hired 30 Singaporean wealth managers and PMETs, trained them here as well as overseas. Now, after being removed from the watch list, the company continues to hire and develop more of our local wealth managers and PMETs to grow their business. Again, another case of win-win outcomes. So far, 150 companies out of the 500 companies have improved their HR practices and exited from the watch list. Of the remaining 350 companies, 60 of them have not been cooperative and show no sign of improvement. We have curtailed, we have curtailed their work pass privileges, no new EP applications, no renewal of existing EPs until they adopt fairer HR practices. Sir, we will continue to fight this win-lose mindset of two-third plus one-third less than one because it results in a waste of our precious human capital. 
Second, for two-thirds plus one-third to be bigger than one, we'll make two-thirds local better and strengthen our local core. I agree with Ms. Jessica Tan and Mr. Lim Biao Chuan. We'll continue to enhance employment and employability of the Singaporean PMETs. We'll create more jobs of the future for them through industry transformation. We'll create more skill of the future in them through the skill future movement. And we'll create more careers of the future with them through the Adapt and Grow initiative. To ensure fair access to more jobs and better jobs, we'll strengthen the fair consideration framework further, as suggested by Mr. Patrick Tay. We'll expand the requirement to advertise jobs on the National Jobs Bank before EP application to cover more employers, not just those with more than 25 employees, but also those with at least 10 employees. At the same time, we also cover more jobs with salary of up to 12,000 as of today to jobs with salary of up to 15,000. This will take effect from 1st of July uh, this year. Sir, thirdly, for two thirds plus one third to be bigger than one, we have to make the one third foreign better. I think a point made by Ms. Jessica Tan. As we moderate the intake of foreign manpower, especially foreign professional, employers say they cannot find enough locals who have the skills and are willing to do the jobs. They say this has slowed down their pace of business transformation and growth. They feel that our foreign manpower policy is too tight. To them, MOM is not pro-business enough. But on the other hand, we hear ground feedback that there are still too many foreigners, too much competition here for jobs with our locals. They feel that our foreign manpower policy is too loose. So to them, MOM is not pro-worker enough. Sir, the policy objective of MOM is to strike a fine and dynamic balance between the two. Open enough to be pro-business, to support business growth, and yet at the same time, tight enough to be pro-worker to enhance local employment growth. We therefore stay open to the intake of foreign professionals, but continue to tighten the criteria for EP. We did that in 2014 and 2017. This is to calibrate the growth of EP holders and enhance their overall quality, both at the same time. Professor Faisal Ibrahim asked for the outcomes. In the past three years, on average, we approve about 50,000 new EPs every year. But at the same time, about the same number of EPs were not renewed. And the growth of EPs therefore slowed to an average of 3,000 a year in the past three years. This is significantly lower than the peak of 32,000 in one year in 2011. So on the whole, local share of, local share of net growth in PMT employment improved from an average of 68% in the previous three years, 2012 to 2014, to an average of 78%. So from 68%, went up to 78% in the past three years. So out of every 10 net increase in PMET jobs in the last three years, seven to eight of them went to our local PMETs. Sectors where local account for a large majority of the net growth in PMET employment include professional services, infocom, healthcare, finance, and insurance. In short, we're able to draw on foreign professionals to help meet the manpower needs of the industry, while at the same time, strengthen our local core. By working together, complementing each other more, and competing with each other less in Singapore, our Singapore workforce of two-third local and one-third foreign will be able to support a faster pace of industry transformation for us to compete better globally for better investment and jobs. Mr. Lee Shan asked for flexibility for employers to hire foreign PMETs, especially those with skills in great shortage in Singapore. Sir, let me clarify that the tightening of EP criteria should not be an issue for most foreign professionals with skills in great demand globally and in short supply locally. This includes, for example, AI, data analytics, advanced manufacturing, digital services. Expertise often cited, these are the expertise often cited in the media by the various business group. Now, such professionals will command a salary premium and should be able to meet our EP criteria in terms of salary, qualification, and experience. 
with the exception of those on our FCF watch list, as long as the employing companies have complied with our FCF in giving fair consideration to our local PMETs, they should generally be able to obtain approval for work pass applications for such specialists in short supply locally and in critical shortage locally. In the exceptional situation where the EP applicants with the skill set much needed here and yet are not able to meet our EP criteria, we do allow sector agencies to exercise some flexibility, but only in a highly selective manner. On the condition that there's indeed a shortage of such skills here and that these foreign professionals are needed to help to speed up our industry transformation and growth. Sir, so on balance, our manpower policies is both pro-business and pro-worker. It's designed to improve the quality of both our foreign and local workforces in Singapore and enhance the complementarity with each other. This is so that we can meet the manpower needs of businesses for them to transform and grow and the career aspiration of our people for them to adapt and grow. Guided by this policy objective, we'll introduce further change to make one third foreign even better. Now, for the s -pass holders who are mid-career skilled foreigners, their minimum qualifying salary was last updated in 2013. I agree with Mr. Patrick Day that it's timely to review and will increase the entry-level salary by 200, up from 2002 to 2004. As per current practice, those with more years of experience will need to meet higher salary thresholds. To allow companies more time to adjust, the increase will be done in two steps, $100 from January next year and next $100 from January 2020. We also provide a transition period for existing s -pass holders. As for work permit holders, there will be no further tightening for now, hence no change to dependency ratio ceiling, DRC and levy. As pointed out by Mr. Melvin Yong and Mr. Thomas Chua, our effort, our focus is to enhance quality and productivity of this foreign workforce. Work permit holders at basic skill level are too, from non-traditional sources and PRC, they are now allowed to work here for a maximum of 10 years. Those with higher skills, R1, in services and manufacturing, are allowed to stay here for up to 18 years. And 22 years, if they work in construction, process, and marine shipyard. In response to feedback from the industry, we will extend the maximum period of employment by another four years. So those from 10 years will now go to 14 years, 18 years to 22 years, 22 years to 26 years. This will apply to all sectors and for both R1 and R2 to take effect from 1st May this year. We also give employers more pathway to improve the quality of their foreign workers. Besides skills certification, those who are more experienced with higher salary can also be upgraded from R2 to R1 pass. This is currently allowed for construction, process and services sector. We will extend it to manufacturing and marine shipyard sectors. We believe this will be helpful to companies that want to hire and retain their better work permit holders. It will take effect from 1st of September this year. Fourth, for two-thirds plus one-third to be greater than one, we need to make the plus better. To recognize and spread the adoption of progressive HR practices, we launched a HCP in February last year. 134 HC partners are now on board. They are from various sectors, ranging from MNCs and SMEs as well. Together, they employ about 140,000 locals. Mr. Patrick Tay, Mr. Ms. Jessica Tan, Professor Fajr Ibrahim, asked from the update on HCP. Sir, HCP companies believe in transforming HR into HC, human resource, into human capital. Not consumption of human resource, but investment in human capital, turning HR into the most precious capital. First, there are strong local core at all levels. Collectively, local PMETs account for about 90% of the total PMET workforce in these companies. Not just more than 90% at the entry to middle level, but also more than 80% huh, at the uh, senior to top level. Second, their workforce is highly inclusive. Jobs are redesigned to be less physically demanding for the older workers. Flexible work arrangements are offered to allow those with care responsibility at home to share jobs. 
and for employees to go on sabbatical and pursue new opportunities within the company when they return, to pursue part-time studies to upgrade themselves or to enable retired employees to return to work on a part-time basis. Third, HCP companies believe strongly in strengthening local foreign complementarity. They transfer skills from foreign experts to our local workforce and build out local core in their senior management team. Our HCP partners, which, or rather one HCP partner, which left a deep impression on me, is Keystone Cable. Keystone Cable is a local SME with 140 employees. It's a maker of power and control cables with a strong foothold in the region. The plant is located in Sunoco, not easy to attract locals. In fact, it has to work doubly hard to compete with MNC for talent. But as a flexible and nimble SME, it embraces the mindset of human capital development. Started off as a delivery driver, Mr. Jimmy Wong is now a sales executive. He brought in $1 million worth of sales in just six months in his new job. He's now being groomed to take on clients in overseas market. The company was able to attract 20% 20 more, uh, 20 more job applicants, uh, applications in uh, last year. But what's even more impressive is that 100% of those they offer jobs to accepted their offers. Sir, we'll keep grooming the HCP community, as suggested by Mr. Peter, uh, Patrick Day. We also promote adoption of tripartite standards, as reminded by Ms. Tana. Fifth and last, we must strengthen the synergy between two-third local and one-third foreign, so that the outcome will not be equal to one, but greater than one. Globally, there is a big concern that technology will take away many jobs. Yet, we see an amazing race to embrace technology. China is the world number one users of industrial robots today. Globally, there's a big concern that foreigners will take away jobs from the locals, yet more countries are opening up even more to attract foreigners with the skills and expertise to offer, including China and Japan. This reminded me of, a story, of the story of two men walking the jungle. A tiger was catching on them. One of them sat down to tighten his shoelace. The other one asked, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm tightening my shoelace. Yeah, but the tiger is coming on earth. You got time to tighten your shoelace? He said, yeah, because I'm getting ready to run. You mean you can run faster than the tiger? No, no, of course not. But all I need to do is outrun you. Yeah. Now, in the global village, it's not possible to outrun the technology, but we can outrun the competition. Those running slower will see more jobs being destroyed by technology. Those who run faster can create new jobs with technology more than the loss of existing jobs to technology. This explains why China is running fast with robots, and Japan is not slow too. With the help of robots and AI, Honda Motor, Canon, Pioneer, they are bringing production of car components, car navigation system, digital camera, back to Japan. So mainly Japan is making a comeback, but this time with the help of not just robots, but intelligent robots and human co-workers. With the world out there running fast, just imagine what if one day a cheaper China becomes better by using technology faster than us. A better Japan becomes cheaper also by using technology faster than us. Now, if this happens, they will become cheaper, better, faster than Singapore. Then what future will we have then? So Singapore must run fast too. In fact, the faster, the better. And we are. We are running fast in advanced manufacturing. At Bedok Industrial Estate, my constituency, Panasonic is building a smart factory there. It will have machines fitted with sensors interconnected to work with each other. Operations will be more manpower lean and the local workers will be retrained to take on new and better jobs, such as, as robot coordinators. The adoption of predictive management will mean near zero operation incidents such as no machine breakdowns, no product defect. We're also running fast in AI. We now have AI Singapore, our national AI program, to anchor deep national capabilities in AI. We also have AI business partnership to encourage and facilitate AI adoptions in our industry. And the AI apprenticeship program to develop AI professionals with key skills 
such as machine learning and deep learning. In digital services, MAS is promoting fintech to realize a vision, our vision of becoming a smart financial center. It's working with industry to push through groundbreaking initiatives, blockchain, uh, quantum computing, big data, AI, and so on. In fact, we move so fast that today, Singapore is one of the top global fintech hub alongside London, New York, and Silicon Valley. We're also running fast in becoming a smart nation. In the 80s, when I was still a young man, right, we became an intelligent island through national computerization, office automation, computer integrated manufacturing. This time round, we aspire to become a smart nation and a digital government through Internet of Things, national digital identity, smart urban mobility, cyber security, and more. Sir, all these are important and strategic initiatives to bring us and keep us at the forefront of global technology and innovation. However, to truly succeed in becoming a pervasively innovative economy and society, we need to do much more. We need to speed up the development and transfer of new and better global capabilities to our local workforce, a point made by Mr. Chong Ki Hyong. Not just in high tech, high profile and high impact sectors, but in as many sectors as possible and as quickly as possible. This is why we're piloting the CTP Capability Transfer Program, because the potential scope for transfer and development of new capabilities is limited only by our focus and determination. Mr. Patrick Day asked for an update. I will illustrate with a few examples. In precision engineering, smartphone is getting bigger, but flatter and lighter. Hence, our local industries need to use softer alloy and fit in more chips and components. Companies need to use high-speed, high-precision machines to prevent cracking and warping. Local engineers and technicians are also required to have new skills to advise on product design and materials selection. To compete well, our local industries need to acquire new technologies and new capabilities to offer lower costs to be cheaper, higher accuracy to be better, and shorter cycle time to be faster. So cheaper, better, and faster. So under the CTP, over a period of 15 months, we support our precision engineering companies to install high-speed, high-precision machines and to bring foreign specialists from Germany to train our local trainers, training locally as well as through remote coaching, who are now able to train our local trainers, are now able to train our local trainees from several companies in the industry. Now, in the areas of pharmaceutical transportation, today more than 20,000 tons of global pharmaceutical cargo go through the Changi Airport uh, annually. And the global market is still growing and growing very fast. But out of 209 companies certified by IETA to handle such cargo, we have only 10 of them here, right, out of 209. So to grow the Singapore's market share in the global industry that's growing very fast, uh, the Singapore Air Cargo Agent Association, the Changi Airport Group, the CAS and the industry, uh, they want to work together to bring in IETA certified trainers from UK, from Dubai, to train a, local of, uh, train a group of local specialists here who will then be able to multiply this capability by training other locals. So in total, we aim for up to 25 companies, up from the 10 currently to 25, to be able to obtain the AITA certification. So here's another example of capability transfer. Sir, CTP is also relevant to domestic sector. For example, in lift maintenance, the current approach is wait for the lift to break down, then repair, then wait for the lift to break down again. A better approach actually is to make all our lifts in Singapore into smart lift, using predictive data analytics and maintenance to shift from correct, uh, corrective maintenance, which means waiting for failure, to preventive maintenance, periodic maintenance before failure, which is being done by many companies today, but to the predictive maintenance, so reduce the probability of failure, so predict what is likely to happen before it happens. So under the CTP, we will partner, we will partner with leading global vendors to bring in overseas specialists or send our local trainers overseas so that later on they can return to train our local trainees here. So in this way, we can anchor smart lift capability in Singapore. Furniture manufacturing is another example. 
Not many of us know that our local furniture industry is a $6 billion industry with over 1,900 companies. Manufacturing facilities here focus mainly on make-to-order furniture. Today, we can design and make furniture using 3 axle computer numeric control CNC machines. 3 axle. I asked them what does it mean by 3 axle. They said the, these machines can move left, right, up, down, front and back. So 3 axle. But in, so in the, world of the, in the words of the industry themselves, we are now seeing industry 2.0. Now to upgrade the industry, our local industry, to 4.0, we will need to we will help them to bring the 5 axle CNC machines where the tools can twist and turn, cut in different directions to create contour and more complex, uh, complex shapes. So this will make the jobs, also make the jobs of the craftsman ESS. So under the uh, CTP, the Singapore Furniture Industries Council, together with Workforce Singapore, will we'll bring in specialists from Italy to train our local trainers and our local craftsmen. Another example of domestic industry is car maintenance. Market for hybrid car grew by 200% in the last two years, from 6,000 a year to 20,000 last year. New capabilities are needed for the repair and maintenance of this hybrid car. No longer just changing the oil filter, uh, checking and replacing battery, lights and brakes, but have to handle a completely different system. Carry out battery load tests, high voltage cable inspection, front motor tests, hybrid transmission tests, and so on. Currently, independent third-party car workshops have no access to certifiable training to improve the skill set of our local technicians. So under the CTP, we will partner the Singapore Motor Workshop Associations to bring specialists from Germany to train our local mechanics and to transfer the capability to our local industry. Sir, these are just some examples to illustrate the point that the scope for capability transfer is tremendous. High tech to high touch, MNC to SME, domestic to export-oriented industries. We'll support group projects from any company and any industry beyond those currently supported by economic agencies for specific sectors. Mr. Patrick Day asked for details of the CTP. To achieve real transfer of capability, project duration is mostly in months and years, not days and weeks. Specialists have to, be, have to do more than just training, but also coaching and working alongside our local workers, be their trainer, mentor, and guide. Costs can often be the obstacles, especially for our local enterprises. So under the CTP, we'll co-fund the cost of this capability transfer for foreign specialists to train our local here or for our local trainers to be trained overseas. So that over time, we'll be able to anchor more capabilities here to upgrade our local workforce and industries as we transform, adapt, and grow. In reply to Mr. Lau Tia Kiang, I would like to assure him that in our project evaluation, we will consult the sector agencies and be guided by the various industry transformation map to ensure that these capabilities will be relevant and uh, uh, will really be relevant and able to strengthen our future competitiveness. Mr. Patrick Day asked about the funding levels. Funding support will range from 30%, 50%, and 70% of the cost of capability transfer, which include salary costs of the expert trainers, both local and foreign, cost of living allowances in Singapore and overseas, airfare, training equipment for the industry. Projects with higher impact on the industry and those benefiting SME will receive higher level of support. So I think Mr. Love needs to hear this. So if you are industry impact, benefiting mainly SME, they'll get higher level of support. Total funding per project is currently capped at $300,000. In exceptional cases, as highlighted by Mr. Patrick Day, where the cost of capability transfer is high and local expertise is much needed but lacking. So funding support of up to 90% and project costs of more than $300,000 will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Desmond Chu said we should scale up CTP and accelerate the acquisition of new capabilities. I agree with him fully. We started the pilot late last year, so just a few months ago. We'll reach out extensively to create more awareness and generate more interest. We hope our sector agencies and tripartite partners, including the labour movement and various industry groups, will make good use of the CTP to fill the many capability gaps in a more pervasive manner. 
And we hope to do this across all sectors, all sizes, with all sizes of companies, as quickly as possible. Sir, our strategy of two-third plus one-third greater than one will help ensure that our Singapore workforce can better support the growth of an innovative Singapore economy and also create better skills, jobs and careers for an inclusive Singapore workforce. Two-third plus one-third greater than one may be bad mathematics. However, if we work together, I'm confident that even bad mathematics can be turned into good manpower policy for the benefit of all.